Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation. Audie is not with us at the moment, but he will probably be back very soon. Uh, it's been raining, and so once we got a break in the rain, he wanted to go out, and I figure yeah, he's been in all day long, so I might as well let him out, let him enjoy a little of it, and he will be back, though. It's too wet for his tastes. So, interestingly enough, when I first let him out, first thing he does is scurries up on top of the trash toter. Now, those of you who have been following the adventures of Audie for some time, and they really sort of start when when this channel began, because Audie began photobombing the videos from, like, the first week. Audie likes to sleep on the trash toters. Yes, I have a trash napping cat. And it's not just my trash toter. He goes over to the neighbor's house and sleeps on their trash toters, too. And I will see a neighbor, and they will say, Oh, hi, Sue, guess what? Your cat was over here three days ago sleeping on our trash toter. We tried to take out the trash, but he wouldn't move. It's like, because, you know, what's the point in doing this if he can't embarrass me in the bargain? So I thought he was going to just sit on the trash toter, but no, it's been raining, so there's a little puddle of water on top of the trash toter. And he wanted to drink trash water. Because it's not like he has nice clean water here. It's not like he has a bowl. Not like I won't turn a faucet on for him. He's got to drink trash water. Because as I say, why do it if he can't humiliate me in the bargain? So I'm pretty sure he will be back. He's gotten his drink of filthy trash water. And once he has a chance to sort of go around and check on the neighborhood, he'll come home. And when he does, I'll bring him in and let him say hi. So, why don't we just take a look at our merry little intro, and I'll be right back. I may not have my cat, but I've got my cat coffee cup. And it wouldn't be coffee in conversation without the coffee. Which is actually not bad. So, what has been occupying my time and my mind lately? Well, a while back when I cleaned out my closet, I realized I had a a very unusual opportunity. It's not the sort of opportunity you get every day. And this was the chance to start rebuilding a wardrobe almost from scratch. And the reason for that is when I got rid of all of the things that have been in my closet forever, I made a point of getting rid of things I hadn't worn in a year most people would say six months. Frankly, I started off with the things I had not worn in five years. I started packing it all away. Uh, almost everything went and went off to uh, um, uh, the Wounded Warrior Charity. That's, that's who got them. I packed it all up, and they came, and they picked it up. So... That meant I had to start rebuilding my wardrobe. And as I say, you don't often get the opportunity to rebuild virtually from scratch. So one of the first things I started looking at was capsule wardrobes. And it was, in fact, a very disappointing journey. Uh, and it's a journey I made mostly on YouTube. There are so many uh, fashionistas, um, women who are, uh, I don't know, self-proclaimed style wizards. I, I don't know. 
I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out if any of them have any qualifications for this. I have found a few who do. Um, and keep in mind, some of these folks, I've been watching their videos for a while. For example, The Closet Historian. And that channel is uh, run by a young woman named Bianca Esposito. And she has a degree in fashion design. So, okay, there you go. This is someone who is qualified. But the problem is she is not into contemporary fashion. Remember the closet historian. So that's how I got hooked on her channel. Uh, for one thing, she, she sews. And I do love the sewing channels. Evelyn Wood from Australia, also vintage clothing. But Bianca does all kinds of vintage of vintage clothing. She she replicates vintage patterns. She will go through the old large pattern books. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, that's not how I want to dress. Despite the fact that I think those 1950s outfits look terrific on her, that's not my style. And I am not going to attempt to rebuild my wardrobe around this notion of, oh, the 1950s. Although, having said that, one of the things I did keep that I have not worn in many years is a 1950s suit. That's staying in my wardrobe. I have this notion that one day I'm going to wear it. But even if I don't, in the meantime, it's a fantastic suit and I'm not getting rid of it. So who knows? Maybe, maybe at the end of the year when I go back and look at what I've accomplished over this year, and I hope it will be enough to make me at least a little bit proud of myself, Maybe that's the point at which I will decide to let that suit go, because it's something I did wear years ago. And yes, I did wear 1950s clothing and 1940s clothing. And um, yeah, my style was a little different, but that's how I got hooked on Bianca's channel. However, as I say, she is not really dealing with wardrobes. Uh, another is uh, Justine Lecon, and she is a French designer. Therefore, she is qualified. But most of the rest of these people, I have no idea what their qualifications are. One of the channels I watch the most is is put together by a pharmacist. Okay. Uh, you know, it's interesting, but am I willing to back up and say, okay, this is an expert? No, of course not. This is a pharmacist. If I have difficulty sorting out my medication, that's where I'm going to go. But I'm not going to find a lot of useful uh, research from that particular channel, despite the fact that I think she's a charming young woman. It's just very difficult to find any of these fashionistas who actually have any legitimate qualifications for the jobs they're doing. So that was my number one obstacle. And then I think my number two obstacle was looking at all of these people and their versions of what a capsule wardrobe is or should be is so far off base. I mean, it really is. It's very far off base. It's as if we're speaking about totally different things. And who knows? Maybe we are. Maybe they have just redefined the term. So I'm going to give you the reality. Uh, and the reason this is the reality is because this is historically what a capsule wardrobe 
is slash was, how long they've been around, which by the way would surprise you. And I am going to also mention for the benefit of my British friends, uh, the young woman who really brought the concept of capsule wardrobe into the modern era. So let's start with what is a capsule wardrobe. Basically, it is a small amount of clothing that is mixed and matched, and that's it. How could anything be more simple than this? We're just not used to this in the 21st century. We are used to closets full of clothing. Hundreds of pieces, literally hundreds of pieces of clothing. And every year, by the way, that number is expanding. So that, you know, if it was 100 pieces on average you had in your closet 20 years ago, it's 150 now. And by the way, that's closer to what it is on average. Although, I do have to say this, when I started looking up these numbers, I'm not getting any consistency. So, that's just the FYI. When we start to look today at how many items are in someone's wardrobe, a woman, ordinarily in the U.S. we're looking at around 200 pieces. I say that hesitantly because if you don't see this video for six months, it could be 250 pieces. And I consider that to be excessive. When I have too much stuff in my closet, I don't know what I have. And most of the stuff is not getting worn. And that is the essence of a modern capsule wardrobe, having clothing in smaller amounts that you you recognize when you open your closet door, for one thing, you know, with a capsule wardrobe, you do not open your closet door and say, where did this blouse come from? I don't remember buying this. It eliminates that. So you have fewer pieces, you get more wear out of each piece, and each piece has more versatility. That's basically it. So medieval times, yeah. That was all they had. You might have two, possibly three changes of clothing. And there were laws. This is the absolute truth. They called them sumptuary laws. There were laws limiting the amount of clothing you could buy. So if you were uh, a noble woman, you would be entitled to get three new dresses a year. If you were the wife of a merchant, with an income of X number of florins, you would be able to get two new dresses a year. If you were a peasant, you would be able to get one working dress, and that was the end of it. It really was regulated like that. I know that sounds nuts to us, but it is the absolute truth. So it was only in relatively modern times and with the middle classes, that clothing more than whatever you had on your back was actually you know, a thing. So let's talk about the woman who brought the concept of capsule wardrobe into the modern era. And she was uh, Queen Alexandra of the UK. She was married to Edward, Queen Victoria's son. So because Victoria had a very long reign, Alexandra was Princess of Wales for a very long time. Now, she was the daughter of Christian the Ninth, I believe. I think it's the Ninth. I'll look it up. If I'm wrong, I'll make a correction. Christian the Ninth of Denmark. And he was a minor German princeling whose father was not king. He came to the throne somewhat unexpectedly. And he, his children were of respectable ages at the time. And Alexandra was his eldest daughter, meaning that she grew up as the daughter of a petty German princeling 
with a limited income, and she had to be frugal. She was not raised in the lap of luxury, although, to be fair, given the economic conditions of Europe in the 19th century, sure, you know, she had more money than most, but not a ridiculous amount, not the kind of money that Victoria's children would have been raised with. So when she married into the British royal family, and by the way, Christian made great marriages for all of his kids. When she married in, into the British royal family, she brought all of that frugality and good common sense from her childhood with her. I think Alexandra is, uh, was a remarkable woman and I don't think we pay anywhere near enough attention to her and her remarkableness. One of the things she did when she moved to Great Britain was brought skirts, blouses, and jackets because her frugality, the, the frugality in which she was raised, had taught her that if she wanted to present herself as a princess, which of course she was and therefore had to do, she had better be clever about it because her family did not have the kind of money most princely families had. So she learned very quickly that if you have two skirts and two jackets, you have four outfits. And she combined them with blouses and she brought that style to the UK. Now, Alexandra was queen of, of Great Britain in the early 20th century. And this is the point at which we start to see capsule wardrobes being mentioned in publications. Um, the 1920s is the usual starting point that people give for when this was a defined term, and it was defined for both men and women. So, it's important to remember that we we haven't invented this. This is not something new and exciting and hours, hours, all hours. No, no. Previous generations did this before us. And the last time we talked about capsule wardrobes, I showed you a film clip from the serial Annette from uh, the Mickey Mouse Club. I grew up on that, by the way. I remember that serial from when I was just a child. And in fact, it was in reruns then, I think maybe. It was like 1959, and yes, I could have watched a first run of that, but I do believe I saw it again when I was a little older. And in that little film, I'm just gonna show you the film clip. These new campus coordinates are simply fabulous for school. The girls just adore them. <laughs> They come in a variety of styles and colors, and they're beautifully tailored, see? Oh, dear. Worn with a classic sweater, they will take you anywhere from early morning to the Saturday afternoon football game. So as you can see, mix and match fashions were a thing, and that's what a capsule wardrobe is. Mix and match fashions. It's being able to coordinate everything. Now, as anyone who was a young person in the 1950s can tell you that did not mean nothing but black and white, not by a long shot. Um, oh, and trust me on this, if you were a teenage girl and wore too much black in the 1950s, early 60s, you'd find your butt in the principal's office and they would be having a stern talking to with you. So, no. It was a question of coordinating skirts and blouses and sweaters to be, able, to be able to recombine them to make different outfits. So when I look at capsule wardrobes on YouTube and all the YouTube videos, oh, it's great. 
One of the things I love about this is they give you a list of must-have items for your capsule wardrobe. And that includes, you know, your black t-shirt, your white t-shirt, your... I actually do have a black t-shirt. That's you know, this, what I am wearing now. Although it has a v-neck and it's got some detailing and it's not cotton. Well, it's part cotton. It's cotton linen blend. Would I consider this to be, you know, a traditional black t-shirt? No, but it is a black t-shirt. I don't have things like that in my wardrobe, and I am not going to build my wardrobe around black and white t-shirts. I like color. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I guess you didn't notice. For me, color is really important. And when I look at the, the version of capsule wardrobe, you find in, on the YouTube channels, I think the first thing that hits me square in the face is they're all black and white and gray. If I had to wear nothing but black and white and gray for the rest of my life, I don't think I'd leave the house. I really don't. Um, for starters, I don't really like white. I don't feel that's a color that looks good on me. I don't think black really looks that good on me either. Oh, so let me explain this because obviously I have to explain owning a black t-shirt. I'm going to explain this very quickly. Uh, linen cotton blend, $10.88. There's the explanation. Uh, I got it on a great sale, and because it was a linen cotton blend, it's very high quality fabric, and so yeah, I grabbed it. Would I have grabbed it if it had simply been a black cotton t-shirt? No, absolutely not. I wanted the linen. Um, would I have paid more for it if it was 100% linen? Yes. Um, but hey, that was what grabbed me. And I, in fact, I grabbed five of these when I found that sale. And this is the black one. So, yeah, it wasn't for the sake of getting a black t-shirt. I would not create a wardrobe around black and white and gray. I, I, Obviously, some people would, some people do. Maybe those people on YouTube are very happy in their monochromatic wardrobes. And if they are, more power to them. But that's not me. So when I started looking at this, I started discounting a lot of these videos that were, these are the staples for your capsule wardrobe because there are no staples for your capsule wardrobe. What, what you would put into a capsule wardrobe, what I am putting into a capsule wardrobe, is the colors that I like, that I think look good on me. Hopefully they will all hang together fairly well. But does that mean it's going to be nothing but neutrals? Absolutely not. I would go bonkers in a purely neutral wardrobe. Does that mean I have to go out and get a little black dress? Absolutely not. I don't wear dresses. I wear pants. So that little black dress, sorry, not happening. You know, a skirt, sorry, not happening. It is going to be slacks and that's the end of the story. I am getting older which means I, unfortunately, I am at risk for falls. And if I fall on my butt on a public street, I do not want to be showing my underwear to the entire neighborhood. Frankly, it is just that simple. I am not a teenager anymore, and I'm not, I'm not going in that direction. I am very comfortable in slacks, always have been. Uh, and now, mind you, there have been points in my life when I have worn dresses, and I've been happy with them. But that's not this particular point in my life. 
I am out of that phase. I am into a pants-only phase. So I would say probably a third of the absolute staples for a capsule wardrobe are not on the table for me. One of the others, oh my goodness, trench coat. No, I don't have a trench coat. I don't want a trench coat. Take the trench coat far, far away. I'm never going to have a trench coat, period. I don't think I have ever had a trench coat. Uh, I come from the Northeast, which means I have winter coats. I'm not buying a new winter coat. I have a 40-year-old winter coat in my closet, and I'll pull that out if I need it. Thank you very much. But no, I don't want a trench coat. I am not going to. Even if I had a trench coat, I wouldn't consider that part of my wardrobe. That would be outerwear. That's something that you put on when you're leaving the house and take it off when you arrive at your destination. It's not part of your outfit, at least not in my view. And I don't know who these people are who are wearing trench coats indoors. It's not me. It doesn't make sense. I And I don't know who these people are who consider their outerwear to be part of, you know, their working wardrobe. This is like, oh, I will put on a pair of pants and a blouse and I'll put a coat over it and that makes it a different outfit. No, it doesn't. That means it's your regular outfit with a coat on over it. So, yeah, and that was another bit of frustration I was ending up with because so many of the fashionistas are saying, well, you know, you got a completely different outfit if you put a coat on. No, you don't. It's the same outfit with a coat, please. So there's a lot of silliness that I am encountering every time I go to a YouTube video and look at this. And what I have been doing is sort of recreating rules for myself. So I know long story short, we owe oh, that ship has sailed, hasn't it? So this is where I'm going with all of this. We can write our own rules. Now, if I look at this and say, I want to put together a capsule wardrobe, and the only reason I'm saying I want to do that is because that is the word that is currently applied for what I am doing as I am recreating my wardrobe, it's a capsule. I'm thinking of it as separates and mix and match. But, you know, I'm giving them credit for the term. If I want to do this, I'm going to have to come about it a very different way. For me, there are no staples. None. I will simply get what I want to get. And if someone believes I need a button-down shirt, oh well, too bad. Uh, the fact is, I do have uh, a couple of button-down shirts, but it's not the same. These are linen, which means they are much, much less formal than a regular button-down shirt. Also, part of the reason I keep button-down shirts, and again, this is going to fly in the face of convention, is because I like cufflinks. I think cufflinks are great. And in order to wear cufflinks, you need a button-down shirt. So yes, I have them to show off my collection of men's cufflinks. And for me, oh, let me explain this very quickly. The reason I like cufflinks so much is because I can't wear a bracelet on my right hand. I, I can't do it. I will bang my wrist into things. It's just, this is sort of my hand that interacts with the world around me. So I really do not put a bracelet on this wrist. And my left hand is where I wear my watch. So there you go. If I want to put jewelry on my wrists, I will use cufflinks. Which brings me to another point. The word is jewelry. J-E-W-E-L. 
are why. Two syllables, jewelry. It's not jewelry. I am hearing that on every last one of these fashion videos I am listening to, and I'm telling you, it drives me bonkers because it is such a simple word. And I imagine the same people who are saying jewelry are not saying jewel when they're referring to a jewel. They're, again, one syllable jewel. I don't know. Okay, that was something that just annoyed me, and you know how I can get about mispronunciations. There you go. But yes, I do have some button-down shirts. Do I think you need them? Well, it depends. Do you have cufflinks? Do you want to start wearing cufflinks? If so, knock yourself out. If not, why would you do that? Why? I'm, it doesn't make any sense. The idea that there are things you must have in your wardrobe for versatility is crazy. I mean, it's just one of the craziest things I've come across lately. So what I would suggest to anybody who is looking to build up a wardrobe, don't make the mistake I did. Do not listen to whatever the fashionistas think you need. Because uh, trust me, they're going to think you need a whole bunch of designer bags. Uh, now, I have a whole bunch of designer bags. I really do. Um, I buy mine on the secondhand market. I do not pay full price for them. I would not pay that kind of money for anything. But yes, but that's not part of my wardrobe. I consider that to be an accessory. It's like the scarves, accessories. There are little things that can enhance your wardrobe. Oh, elevate. That's what the little fashionistas call it, elevate. I swear to God, if I never hear the word elevate again, or lux, if I never hear the word lux again, I will be a happy woman. Um, yes, they have their own little vocabulary. As you can see, I am a little frustrated by it, but yeah, and I shouldn't be mocking them because they have the right to express themselves. I get it. I was young once. I felt free to express myself. In my day, it was like long stringy hair. It was that classic white t-shirt, only mine had holes in it, and I believe I had a pair of false teeth on a chain around my neck. Yeah, my generation was crazy, and I get that, and I'm not interested in turning back the hands of time. So, am I willing to give these kids the space to explore this for themselves? Absolutely. But I do wonder when they decide that somehow they have the authority to speak to everyone about the subject because very few of them seriously have any legitimate qualifications. And when I say legitimate qualifications, I want to see a design degree. I want to see a degree in fashion history. By the way, most of the people that I've found who actually do have those design and fashion history degrees are found elsewhere on YouTube. And believe me, I seek them out and I watch their videos because they know what they're talking about. And of course, I love vintage fashion. But when you sit back and say, well, what is your qualification? I have 700 followers on TikTok. No, sorry, that doesn't quite do it. So they're free to do what they want to do. Um, where they decide they, they have the authority to give other people advice, that's where I start to wonder. So and now I'm going to break my rules and I'm going to give you some advice. No, I do not have degrees in design or fashion 
or a history or fashion history, nothing like that. Just common sense. Don't let anybody tell you what you can and cannot wear. If you want to work out a capsule wardrobe for yourself and your favorite colors are red and purple, you know what? You're going to find a way to make those colors work together in your wardrobe and you may end up with a whole bunch of purple skirts and red blouses and I'm sure you're going to find a way to put them together effectively and stylishly. You don't need somebody else telling you, oh, you must go out and get, get a mar oh, mariner's sweaters. That's another one. There is not enough money in Fort Knox to persuade me to put on a sweater with horizontal stripes. Not happening. Uh, I just, even when I was a very thin, svelte young person, I still wasn't going to do that. Frankly, I consider it a very unattractive style. And that is not a staple of my capsule wardrobe. Mm -mm. Um, other things, a motorcycle jacket. But they call them moto jackets now. I would never do that because I have two motocross riders living right across the street from me. And that is like culturally appropriating their thing. I wouldn't do it. Uh, it that's just something that's their hobby. They are part of that sort of subculture. Not that they're like, you know, hell's angels or anything like that. They're respectable people. They just ride motorcycles, but it's their culture. For me to start wearing the clothing associated with their little subculture, that's appropriation. I wouldn't do it. And quite frankly, even if I didn't mind appropriating their, their jackets, and I was willing to let them laugh at me, even if that wasn't a factor. I don't like that style. And that's the thing. There's so much people are saying, if you create a capsule wardrobe, you must have this, you must do that. So many things I really, really don't like. So what I'm doing now is I am creating it, uh, a capsule wardrobe for myself, and I'm simply ignoring all of their rules. And I'm just slipping back a bit further in time and taking a look at what the capsule wardrobe in the 1920s was. What was it in the 1950s? What was it in Queen Alexandra's day? That's where I'm going for my inspiration, not YouTube. Meanwhile, however, um, if you are interested in taking a look at some, some people who have interesting takes on fashion, I would say Justine LeConte, that's, that's where you want to go. Start with her and move on. But she's actually a fashion designer. So she does have the authority to speak on this. Um, if you are interested in getting some advice from other people, Evelyn Wood, Australian seamstress, again, deals in vintage clothing, but she has videos where she has put things together, com combining and recombining in different and very interesting ways. There are people out there, they are worth looking at, listening to. But in general, going to YouTube and saying, I am going to get some advice from a fashionista who has a TikTok channel, an Instagram account. It's like, if that's their only qualification, walk away. It's just, it's all well and good to watch these folks for fun. But for legitimate advice, no, 
No, you're not going to get it there. If you want legitimate advice, go to someone who is qualified to give you that advice. So that is my take on it. Now, I'm going to go see if my bad boy is around and willing to make an appearance. So I'm either going to come back and sign off or I'm going to come back with a bad kitty. One way or another, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, he was willing to come in. Um, he was screaming at me like it was my fault he stayed out that long. Yeah, right. And, of course, now he wants me to give him food. But we did get a chance to see Audie. So now we're going to take a look at a slideshow, and I will see you all tomorrow. <laughs>